Thank you, Matt. Um, <clears throat> good stuff before us today. Turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 5, as we're going to continue on in the Gospel of Luke. And um, this seriously is probably... Hold on a second, series going off. <laughs> So there are a couple things to pray for. A sound man is one, because I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and George is our audio video guy, but he's all the way back there. So um, anyways, what was he saying? Um, in Luke chapter 5, this is probably one of my favorite passages to study, to teach, and then to apply and live. Um, this is a really, really good passage. It's a really good challenging one for us as a church, especially a small little fellowship that God is growing and, and, and wanting to grow even more and do something. But it's going to take us to be obedient to what God is asking us to do. And so let's stand. Let's read Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, and then we'll study it and break it down um, because there's some really good insight in here for us as the Lord would um, want to challenge us this morning, okay? Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. So it was as the multitude pressed about to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and he asked him to put out a little for, uh, from the land. And he sat down and he taught the multitudes from the boat. And when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their nets were breaking. And so they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken, and so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. And so when they had brought their boats to the land, they forsook all and followed him. Lord, once again, thank you. Teach us, instruct us, challenge us today. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Have a seat. So, when I was growing up, played sports all my life, played baseball, soccer, um, played all kinds of sports. I wrestled in high school and... Um, did all kinds of things. I was a break dancer. I raced BMX. I mean, I did a number of things. I had a wonderful childhood as a kid growing up. But my, my passion was baseball. I come from a soccer family. My dad, sorry, I don't mean to brag, but my dad played professional soccer for the national team in Guatemala. My uncle played uh, professional soccer for the national team in Ecuador. My brother was going to try out for the U.S. Uh, junior Olympic team, and then he blew out his knee. Um, and so th there was a number of, uh, there's, there's really good soccer blood in my family, but I love a real sport like baseball. <laughs> Just kidding, Dad. 
But I love baseball. I, I love baseball. Baseball is just, I love the game. It's a, it's a passion of mine. And growing up, playing baseball all my life, there are certain players that I would like to emulate and watch as they would, the way they would bat, you know, the way they would uh, field the ball and position themselves. And my favorite athlete of all time, and probably the greatest athlete of all time, was Bo Jackson. And I used to love watching Bo. And everything about Bo, I wanted to be. I wanted to be 6'2", 225, and I fell a little bit short. I got the weight, but I didn't get the height. Um, but, you know, I fell short of being that, and muscular and all this stuff. And, but everything that I would watch about Bo Jackson, I wanted to be. I wanted to be athletically gifted like Bo. When you look at people's lives, when you look at other people's lives, what do you see? Are there people or, or examples that you have in your life that you want to be like someday? Here, we have a beautiful example of Jesus who has, one, a heart for people, two, a desire to reach people, and then three, a desire to use you and me. And it's a beautiful picture here as we see how Jesus calls his disciples and there's you're going to see there's two crowds here there's two different crowds in this passage and so in verse one it says one day jesus was preaching at the shore of the sea of galilee and great crowds great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of god Great crowds came in and were pressing in on Jesus there at the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is not really a sea. It's really a lake. The Jordan River actually fills into uh, this body of water known as the Sea of Galilee there in the northern part of Israel. And it's just a it's a beautiful, beautiful lake. I've been there twice, but I've been blessed to be to go to Israel twice. And and it's amazing. And, and being there, um, the last time I was there, I actually taught on a boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee and looking at Capernaum, where Jesus uh, did all of his ministry based, most of his ministry. And I remember our tour guide, um, he had us see the Jordan Valley. You can see the Jordan Valley was feeding into the Sea of Galilee. And he says, put your right hand on the Jordan Valley. And then there's the Arbel Mountain which would be the, the cliff that we read about a couple weeks ago where when they got mad at Jesus for the sermon that he preached, they tried to push him off. Um, there Jesus would come from that area into Capernaum. And he says, now put your hand on the Arbel Valley. And so I'm standing there on the Sea of Galilee like this. And he goes, you are holding in the palm of your hands 75% of the gospel. And I was like, oh man, this is awesome. This is so powerful. And yet, being there and reading this passage, I'm picturing a lot. I'm seeing a lot in my mind. One day, God willing, we'll go to Israel. We'll, we'll, we'll team up with David Trujillo or uh, Pastor Bill or some of these other smaller Calvaries, and we'll team up and we'll go to Israel. And... Um, you will love it. And I promise you, you'll never read the Bible the same again. Everything just jumps out. And this passage is one of those passages that just jump out. Jesus was standing by the Sea of Galilee and people were pressing in on him for what? To hear the word of God. They came excited to hear the word of God. By way of application, this is a very, very simple practical application. What is your heart like in coming to hear the Word of God? Is it a pressing? Is it an excitement? Is, or is it just a routine Sunday thing that you do every Sunday? Are you coming to hear from me? Don't come to hear from me. You'll be disappointed every time. Come to hear from the Lord. Come to hear from the Lord. On your way here, I encourage you, pray Pray, Lord, God, you know what I need to hear. Lord, I, I need your word. God, I'm excited. I want to hear. There's something I know that you want to say to me this morning. What is it? God, I'm all ears. Prepare my mind. Prepare my heart for what it is that you want to say. And come excited. Come excited to worship. It's okay to clap, guys, when we're leading worship. It's okay. It's okay to raise your hands. 
It's okay to dance around and swing from the chandeliers. No, it's not okay to do that. But um, it's okay to, to just to be charismatic, to show your love and excitement for the Lord. It's okay. God desires that. He wants that. But listen, they came in and they pressed in to hear the word of God. I am attempting to give you the word of God. They came to hear the word of God. John 1 says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. They were in the midst of the very living word of God, Jesus himself, and the people were coming. The people were coming and they were excited and they were pressing in to hear what he had to say. What was he going to say? What was he going to tell them? We don't know because there's another message here. It just simply says in verse 2, he says, that he noticed two boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their net. There was two boats there, sitting there, and Jesus sees the disciples washing their nets. Now, a boat is simply a vessel. It's a water vessel. That's all it is. Um, and it was a vessel that later we're going to see that God used. But you and I are simply vessels that God wants to use also as well. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20 says this. He says, in a, in, a, in a wealthy home, some utensils are made of gold and silver. Some are made of wood and clay. The expensive utensils are used for special occasions, and the cheap ones are for everyday use. If you keep yourself pure, you will be a special utensil for honorable use. Your life will be very clean, and you will be ready for the master's use to use for every good work. One, do you want to be a vessel that he could use? Two, will you be a clean vessel that he, that he can use? A vessel of honor. There's vessels of honor and uh, vessels of dishonor. There's vessels that are used for specific occasions. There are vessels that are used for everyday purposes. I mean, we have them, right? We got paper plates, we got plastic plates, and then we got the nice china stuff that we bring out uh, at Thanksgiving and Christmas and those special occasions that we have. Jesus is seeing these two boats and he sees these, these men washing their nets. This is very important to keeping a clean vessel, by the way. Here, here's the picture here. The net was simply a tool that they would use to fish every day. They didn't have fishing poles like we have today. Um, they used a net and they would cast the net. And that net would, um, today, the reason why they would wash their nets, I found out in the last trip in Israel, is they would wash their nets because they would like to wash off all the oil and the scales and the residue from the other fish that were, had just been caught because that became a deterrent. That, that, would, that would warn the other fish, like, don't get caught up in this thing. There's something fishy going on around here, right? It's dangerous. Get away from that thing. So they would wash the net. It also would keep the net from cracking and getting really brittle and dry. It would keep it soft as well. Because if it gets brittle and dry, then a net is full of holes, right? But there's small, controllable holes. But then if it starts getting brittle and dry, it starts breaking, and now you have these big, gaping holes, and then guess what? Your catch is getting loose. You're, you're out there for nothing. The picture here is that it was, was a daily chore for them to wash their nets. Mark says that they were also mending their nets. So that they would see these, these holes, and as they saw these big gaping holes, they would go and they would tie it and mend it to patch that little area that was bigger than normal. So there's two things. that was a daily chore, was the washing and then the mending. For us spiritually, what does that mean? For us, it means that spiritually we are to wash ourselves with the water of the word. Husbands, it tells us in Ephesians chapter 5 that we're to wash our wives with the water of the word. 
which means that we ourselves should be washing ourselves spiritually as well. We should be getting in the word ourselves. The wife husband is a reflection of your leadership. If she's unhealthy spiritually, it's a reflection of your leadership. No matter of what's going on in her life or what happened in her life or this and that, she is a reflection of your leadership. That responsibility falls to you as the husband. And so we're to wash, but before we can wash, we also need to be washed. Our net needs to be clean. Those, those holes, those parts in, in, in our life that need to be mended, those, 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 those places that are hurt, those, the areas of, uh, that need to be confessed and dealt with, those, those things that anything that would be a deterrent, anything that would, would push people away, anything that would blow your witness, that needs to be washed and it needs to be mended. And that only happens when you sit at the feet of Jesus. That only happens when you're in His Word. When you're spending time in prayer, and it's a quiet place with the Lord, you. Ladies, if your husband's not doing that, as he should, then you have a requirement for yourself as well to be washing your own personal net and mending your own net as well by meeting with the Lord and allowing him to do this work in your life as well. This is a beautiful thing. Because there's many times where our witness, it's like, you know, like when you go to catch a matinee, right? And you come out and it's like, uh, right? And, and sometimes our witness can be like that, right? It can be so offensive to people and we just blow it. Something that we say or something that we do. And it's just like, yuck. And people say, well, if that's Christianity, I don't want anything to do with it. I want to represent the Lord well. And I know that I'm a work in progress, and so I know that I need to be sitting at the Lord's feet, and I need to be washing my net daily. And I need to be allowing Him to mend me, and washing me, and cleansing me, and forgiving me of the sin, confessing my sin, and all this stuff. That's a daily chore that we all need to be doing. It's just being real, sitting with the Lord. That's good stuff. Verse 3 says, check this out. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push out into the water. To push out into the water. I like how the New, or the New King James puts it. <coughs> he, says, he says, so then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and he asked him, to put out a little from land. He asked him to push out. He said, hey, Peter, um, can I use your boat? Cool. Can, can we push out a little bit? Because the, the crowd's pressing in. I have something I want to say to them. But Peter, I need your boat. Can I use it? And, and Peter said, of course, Lord, of course. And he got in a boat and he pushed out. And Jesus began to give a message. But listen. There were two boats. One of them belonged to Peter. And Jesus asked Peter, can I use your boat? Peter, can I use you? Uh, I wonder if Peter said, yeah, but Lord, my, my boat's dirty. <laughs> we were just came back fishing and it was just all, I don't, I don't care. It, it's old. It might sink. I don't care. Yeah, but, you know, it's broken over here. It's shipped. I don't care. Can I use your boat? It was the vessel. God might be saying to you, hey, can I use you? Can I use you today? What? But God, I have this issue. I don't care. I still want to use you. I, I want to use your weakness. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. Can I use you? Can I fill you? Can I empower you? Can I speak through you? He didn't have to choose Peter, but he did. Aren't you glad that Jesus chose you? 
Aren't you glad that he saved you? Aren't you glad that he pulled you out out of that horrible pit, out of that miry clay? Aren't you glad that he said to you, I love you and I want to save you? And now he's saying, hey, now I choose you. I want to use you. Can I? Beautiful thing. So he sits in the boat and he begins to speak to the crowds from the water. And it says in verse 4 that when he had finished speaking, or when he had stopped speaking, and said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Hey, I, I gave this message to the people. Now I have something that I want to teach you. I taught them. Now I want to teach you. Two crowds here. Two groups. There are those that came to hear the message and they were there by the, by the, the, on shore. And that's a good place. They came and they, they heard the message. They came and they said, they said, give us, feed us. We're pressing in. We, we're excited. We want to know more. Awesome. And, he, and then all of a sudden Jesus says, but hey, um, you guys, come on, let's go. Get in. Peter, go out a little bit deeper. Now I want to teach you. Two crowds. One that heard the message. Others that said, yes, I'm a boat. Use me. Let's go deeper. I want to go deeper. You know that God is always wanting to go deeper with you? Do you know that, that, that getting saved wasn't just enough? I mean, like, it, it's a lot. It's the main thing, saving you and, and, and God wanting to have you for all of eternity. But do you know that, that he's got something deeper for you? He's got something more? That your life where it's at right now, it's, it's not just that, that he, he wants to just have you come into real life and, and come in on Sundays and this and that. We're only meeting once a week, so what, what's going on the rest of the week? Do you know that he wants to take you deeper? Further? That he wants to take your vessel and he wants to fill it and he wants to go deeper and use you. Are you available in that way? I love, if you would, turn with me to Ezekiel 47. This is a great picture of uh, uh, the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit um, wants to use us and empower us. Ezekiel is having a vision and he's standing And the Lord challenges him and he says, hey, Ezekiel, go in a little deeper. And he says that, 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 that he got in a little bit deeper into this, into this water and the water came up to his, his ankles. That picture there is as, you know, the water coming up to your ankles. That would be, I would say, the picture of salvation, right? The Lord is saying, hey. I, I want to save you, and I'm calling you. You're a sinner. I have a plan for your life. I want to draw you to myself. And so you, by faith, you step into the water, and you, you take a step of faith, and you put your faith and your trust in the Lord, and you trust Him in that way. But it's only ankle deep. There's, there's a whole body of water in front of you. The Lord says, I want to take you deeper. So then he goes a little bit further, and the Bible says there in verse 4, he says, that, oh, but the water came up to my knees. Oh, the knees is always a picture of what? Prayer. That now that I saved you, now I want to get to know you, and I want you to get to know me. And so now as I want to take you deeper spiritually, deeper personally, I want you to now spend time in prayer with me. And I want, I want, you, to, I want you to get down on your knees, and I want you to intercede, and I want you to lay your requests. I want you to intercede and pray for others, and I want you to lay your requests at me because I, I, I know your heart, but I want you to hear it as well. He says, but I'm going deeper with you. I'm taking you deeper. I'm taking you further. And then he challenges them and he says, come out a little bit further. And he says, he goes a little bit deeper. And it says there at the end of verse 4 that the water came up to his waist. 
the waistline. You guys, that's where all the reproductive organs are. That's where God says, hey, I want you now, now that I've saved you, and now that you're getting to know me, and I know you more. I've always known you. But now you're, we're building this relationship through prayer. Now I want you to go deeper. And it comes up to your waistline, and now I want you to reproduce. I want you to go and talk to people. I want you to share with people what I'm doing in your life, what I'm sharing with you. There's, a, there's a repro the, the, the reproduction that's happening. And then it goes, verse 5, And then he measured another thousand cubits, and now the water was too deep, and it was so much that it came up to his neck, and he was swimming in it. Now he's, in, he's engulfed. He's just submerged in the presence of God. That he's a changed man. He went from being ankle to knee to waist to now he's just blown away at the Lord. If you were to measure your life by Ezekiel, if you were to look at your life as Ezekiel, at what stage would you see yourself in right now? Would you be ankle deep? Would you be knee deep? Would you be waist deep? Or would you be like right here? Have you guys ever been in a river that just, you get in the river and it just takes you? And you're trying to, it's powerful. And you, you really don't have much control. And so you're swimming and you're going up against it, but you really don't, you're not really too successful. You just gotta just go in, right? Because the river's just saying, the Lord's just saying, hey, I want all of you. I'm glad I got your ankles. I'm glad I got your knees. I'm glad I got your waist. But now I want all of you. And I want to take you deeper and I want to take you where you've never been before and I want to use you in a way that you've never been used before. I want to do something great in you. That is the picture here. And so Jesus is teaching the disciples, hey, go deeper. Push out, Peter. Push out. Push out into the unknown. Push out into an area that you, you, don't, you don't know what I'm about to do. But I love what happened here. Verse 5, Peter's answer. He says this. He says, Master, Simon replied. Whoops, i got to get back to Luke. He says, but Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. You know what's interesting? Every time I read Peter and the disciples fishing, they're never catching any fish. They're horrible fishermen. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't ever read them being successful fishermen. They're, they're, they're never catching anything. And Peter here is saying, Lord, we've toiled all night. All night, and we, we haven't caught anything. And, and, but hey, you know what? At your word, I'm going to let down the net. This is beautiful. Peter is a trained Fisherman. This is what he does for a living. This is his trade. Okay? This is his trade. He says, let down your nets for a catch. But he says, but I, God, I know what I'm doing. And we told all night, trust me on this. You're the evangelist. I'm the fisherman. Trust me on this. We've told all night. We've caught nothing. The fish aren't out there, Lord. He says, but... I'll let it down. You know what he's saying? It's like, I, I know what I'm talking about, but you apparently know better. You know better. You know more than me. And I'm going to be obedient to you, and I'm going to trust you. You guys, Jesus doesn't do things our ways because his ways are not our ways. His ways are above ours. I don't care how good you are at your trade. I don't care how long you've been doing it. I don't care what you are doing or whatever. Jesus is far greater. And he does things better. And when if he tells you to take a step of faith, 
is because he knows something that you don't know. This was his area, area of, this was his profession, this was his area of expertise, but Jesus wanted to take him deeper in his faith. Jesus knew that he stunk at fishing. <laughs> he says, you're not good, I'm going to take you, and we're going to catch some fish. And, and, and so, don't make excuses for trusting God. Just do whatever he's asking you to do and you will see. Charles Stanley said this, one of my favorite quotes. He said, you want to know what the will of God is for your life? Just do the next thing he tells you to do. It's that simple. A lot of times we don't, we don't just do the next thing that he tells us to do. And we're trying to figure out what his grand will for our life is. God said, well, I've given you this one little thing for you to do. And you want me to tell you all this. But I've asked you to do this. Parents, you know what I'm talking about, right? You tell your kids to do something, and they want this. But wait, wait, hold on. I asked you to do this first. And then if you do this, then we'll go here, right? We'll get something. And it's just that simple. And the Lord's the same way with us. Hey, you want to know my will? Just do the next thing I tell you to do. I love that quote. Don't make excuses for trusting God. Yes, it doesn't make sense, but that's okay, because faith never makes sense. Faith makes miracles. And that's something that we have to understand. Faith makes miracles. I look at my, uh, when I was uh, working at LA County Sanitation, and I took the job at Calvary Downey, and I left this great job, and I remember my mom sitting me on the couch, and she said this, she said, honey, I'm sorry, I hate to tell you this, I know your, your call um, for the ministry and all this stuff, and she was being a great mom, she says, son, um, but if you take this position, uh, this would be the dumbest thing you've ever do, and I was like, huh. My mom's coming against me. She doesn't want me to do ministry. That's not it. My mom won't love me, and she's seen something bigger. And I was like, oh my gosh, Lord. What do I do? And I looked at the paper of our bills, because I did our budget, and what Downey was offering me at the time, and I had more going out in bills than I had was what I was going to get in income from Downey. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And I remember talking to Pastor Neil at the time. And he says, well, Fish, if this is just a lateral move, then it's not faith. You need to know that God is calling you. And if he's calling you, then you take that step of faith and he'll meet your needs. And God has been meeting our needs ever since. He's have us, he has us on this this." Uh, this walk of faith, trusting in Him. And here we are, 13 years later, and God is still meeting our needs. And I look at my bills, and I look at what I'm getting, and it doesn't make sense, but God says, it's okay, I'm meeting your needs. I, I, I'll, I'll meet it, I'll do it. That's faith. And it's literally miracles at times, what God is doing, and I'm just like, whoa, whoa. This is insane. This is amazing. He always wants to take us deeper. And when it doesn't make sense, that's always a good thing. Because if it makes sense to you, then you, you'll, you'll contemplate it and you might say, nah, nah, that's just a dumb move. But when it doesn't make sense... When it doesn't make sense and you know it's God, you know it's God telling you, hey, I want you to take, I want you to take a step of faith and I want you to just go. And I will do something beyond what you can do as you trust me. Verse 6 says, and at this time, after he lets the net down, Peter in obedience, he says, okay, it doesn't make sense, but all right, here we go. And he lets the net down. You know, in another gospel, it says that they were fishing, and Jesus told them to take the, take the net and throw it on this side of the boat. What's the difference? It's the same body of water. What's the difference, God? I don't know if you've ever been fishing on a boat, but I've been fishing on a boat, and you cast your line, and sometimes the line goes under the boat. Right? You're like, what's the difference? If I throw the net on this side or this side, there's no fish here. What's the difference? 
uh, God is telling you to do it? <laughs> That's the difference. And so he's, he throws the net into the water, and verse 6 says, it says, And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to the partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came out and filled both boats so that they began to sink. He says this, he says, throw your net out, and as you trust me, and as you obey me, I'm going to blow you away. And what happens? Boom. The, the catch is so great that the nets begin breaking. They have to signal the other boats to come in. Hey, come in, come in. We need help. And they start pulling in the fish. And then, oh my gosh, we've got more fish. Throw your nets out. And then their nets start filling. And now it's so much that their boat is sinking from the weight of the fish. This never would have happened if Peter never obeyed. Because Peter obeyed, he saw God do something great. Far greater than he would ever would have imagined. Is there an area right now that God is telling you to trust him and obey him in? Is he challenging you in something? Is he challenging you to just go and step out and try this? Is he prompting you in an area, in a direction? It's to your benefit that you obey. It's to your benefit that you listen and that you trust. Because what happened is not only did Peter get blessed, but he had to signal in the other boats. So when you take that step of faith and you trust him, not only are you blessed, but everyone around you sees it and they get blessed as well. And that is so encouraging. When I look at other people taking steps of faith, when I, look at, when I look at other people walking in obedience, and I know that it was a challenge for them, and I know that, you know, they shared something with me, and like, I don't know, man, I think God's calling me to go out here, I think God's calling me to do this, and, but I'm not sure, man, I know this is, this is crazy, and yet they go, and they trust the Lord, and then you see them just get blessed incredibly, and they're like, oh my gosh, and I sit back and I'm like, this is so awesome. This is so awesome. It might be hairy, it might be scary, but trust me, you will always be blessed when you trust Him. Always. When Simon Peter, verse 8, realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and he said, Oh Lord, please leave me alone. I'm a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were other, the others with him. And his partner James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Peter here is falling to his knees because he realized how foolish it was for, not to trust, for him not to trust the Lord and to doubt him. I wonder what I've missed out on in my life when I didn't trust God and I didn't obey Him and I doubted Him. I wonder what kind of blessings I missed out on. I wonder what kind of blessings my parents would have missed out seeing in my life by not trusting. Peter realizes, oh my gosh, and he falls to his knees and he's in, in, in just embarrassed at his lack of faith, at his lack of, of, of just doubting the Lord. I pray that the Lord shows us how, how foolish we can be at times when we simply just don't trust Him. I pray that we see that, that we just remain humble and just be obedient and just go. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, we all know it, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. So there's some key words in there. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Not just a portion of it. Not just in areas that you're comfortable with trusting in the Lord. But all of it. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Stop analyzing. 
one of the one of the greatest things about this, uh, one of the greatest, most annoying things about the sport that I love so much is how much they use analytics on teams and players. And they value players. They value people by their analytics. They're now bringing people down to a number. And it's very frustrating. But yet, we can do the same thing. We can analyze and overanalyze things and, and become critical and judgmental and try to say all kinds of things about, about uh, whatever the situation is. And that it, it, you're leaning on your own understanding. You don't have all the answers. And yet God is saying, trust me and don't lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge me. All of your ways, acknowledge me. And I will direct your paths. But like Peter, this is so dumb. I can't believe he wants me to throw the net. We've been out here. Okay, fine. At your word. I wonder if he had that type of attitude. I don't know. But either way, he didn't lean on his own understanding and he just threw it. And he trusted, and he got blessed. Oh, and then here comes the challenge. The challenge that we see here is incredible. Verse 10. So James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were their partners with Simon, were all amazed. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid from now on, you will catch men. Or your Bible might say, from now on, you will be a fisher of men. I've taken you, I've taught the people, but I took you deeper. I used you and your vessel, and I took you deeper. Because now I want to take you even deeper. You're no longer going to be fishing for this fish. By the way, you just got to accept it. You're not good at it. You're going to be fishing for the hearts of men. You're going to be fishing for, for, for souls, for people. And here is the lesson. It's so much greater than you. God's call on your life is so much bigger than you. You were created for something so much greater than what you're doing. I never in my life pictured myself here. I'd never wanted to be a senior pastor. I was content teaching high school kids. I was, I was fine. And God started moving in my life. And God started opening doors and he began shutting a door. And then there was a door that was open and I was too afraid to go out. I was leaning on my own understanding. I was too afraid to go out. And God said, okay, hey, get out. And he launched me out deeper. And I was like, oh my gosh, how do I do this? And here I am today. I still don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I still don't know what I'm doing. But here I am today. I'm so blessed every week that you guys come out and listen to the Lord speaking through me. Like, why? God is amazing. What does he want to do with you? In your area of profession, what does he want to do? How, how does he want to use you? I know this. It's not just so that you can do your job. It's not that. He uses your job to provide for you. But it's so much deeper. I want you to think about the person at your job right now that needs Jesus bad. That's why. He wants to use you. He wants to push you out deeper to use you. He wants you to fish for their heart. He wants to use you to share the gospel. Today, people need the good news. That's what gospel means. They need the good news of Jesus Christ. 
but it's going to take you to go deeper. Will you allow him to use your boat? Will you let him? He tells him, Peter, don't be afraid, because it can be scary. I, I, I respect guys that are just, you know, they can walk up to people. I can do it, but I wasn't always like that. But I, I, I respect guys that can just walk up to total strangers. I, one of my best buds, Anthony Praheen, most of you guys know him. He can talk to anybody about Jesus, probably because he looks like Jesus. But he can talk to anybody about Jesus, right? And he, 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 he'll open up, he'll just, he just, he's amazing. His way with people is just amazing. His heart to tell people about Jesus, it's, it's, it's infectious. I love being around the guy. There's no, there's no restaurant I can sit in with him. There's no game I can go watch. There's no place I can go with him where he doesn't tell somebody about Jesus. Everywhere he goes, he talks to people about Christ. To me, you know what that says? He's, he's just madly in love with the Lord and he believes so much in the power of the gospel and he just wants everybody to know Jesus. That's just his heart. I'm not saying that's not your heart. I'm just saying that's his heart. And he's very bold about it. He, he don't care. He don't care if you make fun of him. I think I asked him one time. Yeah, I did. I asked him, does it bother you? And people, he's like, no, I'm going to heaven. Like, I, it doesn't bother me at all. And I'm like, wow, this is so cool. Verse 11 says, so they landed, they came back to the water. Jesus teaches them this lesson. They come back to the water. They landed, and it says they dropped everything and they followed him. My life's changed. That's it. Go, Whatever you want, Lord. <laughs> My life's changed. They dropped everything and they followed him. Jesus first. Jesus first. I, I don't care about anything else. It's Jesus first. It ought to be that way in your life. It should be Jesus your family, and then everything else is below that. You can prioritize everything else after that. But it's Jesus first, and then your family. It's not Jesus, the ministry, and then family. It's Jesus, family, and then the ministry. Because your family is your first ministry. And if your family is not your first ministry and you're in the ministry and your family is just all messed up, well, then you need to get out of the ministry. I know people right now whose families are messed up and they're in the ministry and they have no business being in the ministry. They need to get out. They need to take a sabbatical. They need to just take a break. They need to get out of the ministry because their family is hurting. But, oh, but we have all these responsibilities for the church and this and that. No. God will do ministry without The ministry will continue without you. It's so important for us to have our priorities straight. They dropped everything and followed him. That means Jesus became their everything. You can't have sports be your everything. You can't have anything else. Your job be everything. It has to be God. And then everything flows from Him. The challenge here is to go deeper. And now in a specific way, He ends with fishing for the hearts of men. Would you, this week, I was going to do something. I heard, I heard a, um, a pastor share this message. Um, and he was talking about how when they were a smaller church, they had taken the tithe and the offering. And, and I was talking with George and I was praying about it because I'm like, wow, this is way out there. 
But at the same time, it's very challenging. But I didn't feel the Lord was leading us to do this. And I'm not cheap. Okay, so I just want to say, but they took the tithe and the offering and they didn't accept it for a week. And then they took the tithe and the offering and they gave it back. They divided it. And they gave it back. And with that, everybody had a responsibility to take that portion that was given back to them and go and share the gospel. And go and bless somebody with it. And tell them. Because that's what the tithe and the offering goes towards. Your tithe is your worship. The offering is over and above. It takes the, take care of the needs of the church and this and that. Outreaches and all that stuff. So I was like, man, should we do this? And, and the only reason why I didn't go for it is because I don't believe... The, the Lord didn't place that on my heart. It was something that I saw. I was like, wow, this is really cool. But we have to be led of the Lord in everything. And I just didn't feel the Lord was leading. But you know what? I feel the Lord was leading me to tell you. Use your own money. He blessed you with it anyways. Find somebody. Find somebody. And bless them. And give them the gospel. Do it. Do it. Tell them. Make it your point. I'm going to go fish for the hearts of men this week. I'm going to wash my net. I'm going to mend my net. And I'm going to launch out deeper to an area that I've never been before. And I'm going to go and share my faith. Would it be just walking up to somebody at Lakewood Mall or somewhere and just, hey, what do you say? What do you say? Some of you guys don't even know what to say. I don't even know how to start. You can strike up a conversation and then ask them, when was the last time someone told you there's a God in heaven who loves you? Start there. And share the gospel. Hey, can I buy you lunch? What, weirdo? <laughs> what? I just want to... Can we just, can we sit down and get you a cup of coffee and just sit? I got something I want to share with you. Try it. Go deeper. It doesn't make sense. It, it's, it's not going to make sense. It's going to be difficult. But you could either just be sitting there and rationalize and lean on your own understanding and be like, okay, nah... No, nah, I'm not doing it. And they're not going to listen to me. Or you can just step out in faith and trust him and see what he does. Oh, but I don't know the word. I bet you know it more than you think. Have you ever witnessed to somebody and you start speaking and just stuff just starts coming out? Scripture and you're like, oh my gosh, is that me? <laughs> what? I didn't even know I knew that verse. And it just starts coming out. Because it's not you. It's the Holy Spirit in you. And here's another thing that I learned. If the Holy Spirit prompts you to go to somebody, that means He's prepared that heart. And He's opened the door. You need to go. I'll end with this story. A couple years ago with the youth, we did this um, mission trip, the West Coast mission trip. And we drove all the way up all the way down the California coast. We started at San Francisco and we drove down the coast to San Diego and we stopped at all these famous beach spots and we just went out and we preached the gospel. And we would ask the people that question, when was the last time someone told you there's a God in heaven who loves you? And it, it, it became something, we had skits prepared and all that stuff, and it became something that the high school kids said, hey, Pastor Fish, I don't, we don't want to do the skit no more. Can we just go and just talk to people and just share the gospel? Because they were literally, I mean, we were catching fish, man. Pe people were getting saved. It was amazing. And I was sitting back watching these high school kids. And I was being blessed at, at their obedience, like we just read. And I was like, whoa, they're going for it. This is awesome. And, and they had no fear. They had no fear. At the beginning, they were so afraid. And then at the end, it was, they, they, they were talking to anybody. Trees, plants, all kinds of stuff. But they, they were just talking to anybody. And, and they were just telling people about Jesus. And I remember 
we got here to LA and we stayed the night at the Fred Jordan Mission and we went to um, the uh, Santa Monica Pier. And then God started bringing people to us. I was pumping gas. And this guy comes up to me and he says, hey, uh, sorry, man. He's like, hey, I, I don't, I, I just don't want to, I don't want to bother you uh, for money. He's like, I, I'm, I'm just going to be completely honest with you. I don't want your money. Um, I'm just hungry. So if I get money, I, I do something bad with it, man. I'm addicted to crack and, and I don't want to, I don't want money. I just need to eat. I'm, I'm hungry. And I'm like, wow. And the Lord had brought this guy right to me. And I was just pumping gas. And his name was Lee. I'll never forget Lee. And I go, Lee, um, I go, wow, you came. This is amazing. He's like, why? And I said, see this van full of high school kids? He said, yeah. You see that van full of high school kids? He said, yeah. And I said, um, we're, we're just coming. We just came from up north and we're going down the coast and we're telling people about Jesus. And I said, I have a question for you, Lee. Uh, when was the last time someone told you there's a God in heaven who loves you? And he goes, man, man, I was telling myself that today. He says, I, I walked all the way from Skid Row. He was in Santa Monica. He says, I walked all the way from Skid Row. And I was just going through my life. And I was, and I was like, man, because of my drugs, I burned every bridge Every person that ever trusted me, every person that tried to help me, I burned all those bridges. I stole from them. I lied to them. I deceived them. It's the same thing as lying. But I, I, I did all that, and I had nobody else. My family wants nothing to do with me. I have nobody. But I was walking over here now saying, if there's one person that hasn't given up on me, if there's one person that still loves me, it's the Lord. And I said, Lee, it's true. It's the truth. I said, but have you given, have you responded to that love? Have you given your life to Christ? And he goes, man, no. I've always chosen the drug over anything else in my life. And I whistled and I called the kids out and he sees all these kids coming. And he says, what's going on? I said, we're going to jump you right now, Lee. And we surrounded this guy and I told him what we were doing. I said, we're going to lay hands on Lee, and we're going to pray for God to deliver him of this drug addiction, and then we're going to pray that he surrenders his heart completely to the Lord. And I said, are you ready? And he looked at me with big eyes, and he said, yeah, I'm ready. And I said, okay. And we led him in the sinner's prayer, and he gave his life to Christ. And the next door was this burrito place, and I bought him the biggest, fattest burrito that they had, and I blessed him. And he goes, one more thing. Do, do you have a sleeping bag? My sleeping bag had just ripped because we were messing around the night before with the high school boys, right? And um, my sleeping bag ripped. And I said, you know what? I'm going to buy a new one, man. But here, you could have this one. And he's like, thank you so much. And we gave him the gospel. We gave him a burrito and a sleeping bag. And we didn't know that that was going to happen. And God brought him to us. Do you know that there's people that God brings to you on a daily basis and you just don't see it? We were focused with the intention of sharing the gospel with people on that mission trip, and that's why we saw it right away. But if you're focused with the intention like that all the time, you'll see it all the time. All the time. Let's pray. And let's ask God to challenge us to stir us, to take us deeper. Because listen, he'll only take, he'll only take you as deep as you want to go. He'll ask you if he can borrow your boat. He won't make you. It's completely up to you. He'll take your gifts, he'll take your talents, he'll take your abilities, and he'll take you as far as you want to go. That's it. It's completely up to you. But I, he's giving you those things for his glory. And so I challenge you this morning to take him up on it. I challenge you to let him to uh, do whatever he wants to do with your life. Drop everything and go. And go. Amen or no amen? amen. All right. Father, we thank you. 
Thank you, Lord, for, for everything that you have done and are doing in our life. And Lord, um, I just pray, God, for us, I know you want to take us all deeper. I know that you want to take us all further. And Lord, I know that there is something greater in our life. We are made for, for something greater, God. And Father, I just ask that if there's any type of hindrance in our life, any type of anything, if our net is dirty, if it needs to be mended, Lord, help us. Help us to wash it, to meet with you daily, to allow you to work in our life allow you to mend our net that which is hurt that which is broken <coughs> Father maybe we're just ultra shy God and we just don't know what to say or do Holy Spirit would you fill us would you empower us with your power to be a witness to be a light we want you. We need you. And so with that, I say, God, forgive us. Forgive us of our sin. Forgive us of all unrighteousness. <coughs> and cleanse us, Father. Wash us and mend us. And nothing would escape your touch. You're amazing. Empty us, Father, of ourselves, Lord. May our vessels be vessels for honor, ready for the Master's purpose. And Lord, we just want to pray right now, God, for that specific family member or that co-worker that you want us to share, God, um, your love with that classmate. Give us a burden. Give us a passion. Give us a heart for them. Bug us to pray and then help us to trust you by faith to just go and just share with them. We love you. And we thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.